like take my hands and grab my um, cheeks like this. So now my mouth was like very horizontal, and I would talk <laughs> like that. And I would always have the craziest like uh, bruises on my uh, cheeks <laughs> from doing that. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Muddled Dice. My name is Daniel. Today, Adam is joining us again. Hey guys. And we got a special guest today, Jonas Jonas Turner. I screwed up your name already, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jonas. Jonas. Hello, hello. I don't know why I keep forgetting that. <laughs> That's all right. That's uh, all right. Jonas has worked on lots of indie titles, including Broforce, Nuclear Throne. He's worked with Blambeer and other studios. And his latest game is Tormentor X Punisher. How are you doing today, man? Oh, good, good. I was just skateboarding and got back home just in time for the podcast. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're you're like six hours ahead of us. It's still kind of morning here for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 6 p.m. right now here. Yeah. So I guess 12 <laughs> over there? 11, uh, 12. About 11. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Let's just uh, let's just jump right in. So uh, you want to start with your history as a game developer? You know, how did you how did you get into game development? Where did you start? That kind of thing? Sure, it's actually uh, it's pretty long story, so I'll kind of <laughs> jump jump back and forth a few years. But um, All right. so originally, um, like this is pre before me being ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I went to this like computer club kind of thing as a kid, and like it was I think every Friday or Thursday evening something like that, and it was like uh, held by some dude just having a bunch of old computers like Commodores, Atari 386, 486 computers. And then later on, I think a Pentium is pretty wild. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we would just go over there and play games and stuff. And I saw some like older kids making music over there. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, wow, that's sweet. And I was kind of following that stuff. And then jumping onwards a few years, uh, I got this CD from my aunt from England with a software called Click and Play. It's like a game making software, but you know, kind of a, I guess, like a precursor for multimedia fusion, I guess. Okay. So I started kind of dabbling, making small things with that. I wouldn't even call them games, just, you know, playing around with it. I mean, I was like 10, maybe <laughs> 11 back then. And then uh, just playing around and then started getting more into like music stuff alongside skateboarding stuff. And then a few years just making music, and then I eventually bumped into Yuki Ogallio, who's the composer for Nuclear Throne, Roof Thrusters, and a bunch of other games. So I met him on a show with my old, like, very old band, and he was playing with his very old band, and we just kicked back at the backstage, and we were talking about anime and stuff like that, <laughs> as you do. And then uh, a few years after that, I met him again, because so I kind of moved to a neighborhood next to where he lived and then we just went out hang out and talk about making games because he told me that he's making his own games as well and i was like oh wow i used to make my own games then we started talking about game maker and stuff like that and then kind of he kind of showed me game maker and introduced me to the scene so to say hmm. and i was just like hanging out then i was just hanging out with people on forums doing like mini game jams and stuff like that and then after doing enough game jams uh I guess people started to like recognize me that I make sounds and music, <laughs> sounds and music, <laughs> sounds and music for games, and they were like, "Hey, do you want to make sounds and music for our games?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> how it kicks up." <laughs> nice, <laughs> cool. Uh, what kind of inspirations or like influences do you have for for game development and for sound and music? Oh. Um... Wow, that's always a tough <laughs> question. Because even like now, even from yesterday to today, inspirations change. <laughs> but uh, I guess like mainly, I'm gonna talk from like game design perspective. And to me, like some of the biggest inspirations are people like Cactus, hmm. uh, which is Jonathan Soderstrom who made Hotline Miami, uh, alongside oh God, at yes. least 300 other awesome games. <laughs> <laughs> Like everyone's always like Hotline Miami, but then you're like, yeah, what about these 500 other titles? Right. <laughs> He's done so many games, and 
he has a great talk from 2008 from uh, Assembly on YouTube. Mm -hmm. and even back then, he had made he had just, well, he's doing like 20 or 50 games during that talk. It's like, like uh, how, how, and they're all pretty cool. You know, like, ah, oh, that's so inspiring. And then um, Bo Blythe, Bo Blith, uh, who actually worked on Tormentor, he made a game called Samurai Gun, and that sparked a interest in controls for me. Okay. Like, I had never really thought about controls that much. You know, I just played games and they controlled differently. Mm -hmm. But after playing Samurai Gun, I realized how tight the controls are. Like suddenly just realizing like, oh wow, the controls are the thing that's selling me to this game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was that was a game that kind of sparked my interest in controls. And of course, Hotline Miami as well. So those, right. the, those two games are just really tight with controls. I can feel and... a lot of uh, Hotline Miami influence in Tormentor Punisher. Yeah, yeah, it's the whole kind of, well, top-down shooter. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and the think fast element. Like in Hotline Miami, you can't really slouch around. Right. You have to like look at the room and be like, okay, I need to execute this plan, and then of course the plan will change, and you're like, oh, quickly adjust it. And that's kind of that's kind of a feel that I wanted in Tormentor as well. That's kind of something we were talking about just uh, yesterday, actually, because we were <laughs> we were like talking about playing the game, and uh, I was like, yeah, you just gotta like keep shooting and run forward. <laughs> And he was like, oh, I usually try and, like, shoot the opposite direction that I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just got to <laughs> plow the path, man. Plow the path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there's, like, how I play the game. I actually don't shoot enemies for a while, and I just let them kind of build up. Okay. And then I kind of explode a lot of enemies at the same time. Ah, uh, so mow them down. <laughs> okay, yeah. Different ways, different ways. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, so, okay, so this is something I actually... A question that just came to me you mentioned skateboarding earlier um mm -hmm. that kind of i don't know what the skateboarding culture is like uh, where you're from mm -hmm. but there's there's definitely there's definitely a skateboarding culture in america that oh yeah especially in the early 90s that was kind of um very much punk and very diy um yeah did that kind of visual influence of like those old um like i can't think of the names like yes influence your games and music yes for sure like that's actually uh, talking about influences uh skateboarding is probably like in anything that i do in life mm -hmm. pretty much skateboarding is one of the biggest influences to me just the mentality of skateboarding where um if you like fall down while trying a trick mm -hmm. you, you don't quit there that's the wrong time to quit trying the trick when okay. you fall down you're like okay i need to make this trick otherwise i will always be afraid of it <laughs> right so you have to like conquer the trick while you're kind of down in a sense. And I think it's that kind of mentality that kind of has always been really interesting to me. Like, like you see people who fall down and they're like, okay, I'm never trying this again. Then you see people who fall down and they're like, oh, I'm gonna try it again and they fall again. Like, uh, then you see some people who are like, they fall down, they fall down, they fall down, but they are determined to make that trick. And that's the kind of thing that kind of attracts me <laughs> and it's really interesting really interesting to kind of like in torment one of the core design ideas was you die and you start again right away yeah like no loading screens nothing just back at it and that's kind of yeah that, kind of, ready that, was one of that was one of the things i i noticed when you just mentioned that i was like oh that's kind of like the game because like as soon as you die I find myself a, a lot of times just getting caught up like playing it again and again and not even not even really thinking like I have to make an effort to stop playing it because <laughs> it, it like just starts you back again and you're just like back in the zone and then you're like oh oh I died again oh wait I'm I'm playing again you know oh give me a break yeah. I need to go to the bathroom <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the the thanks the uh the fail faster mentality I think is is really deep in that game like adam said it's it's easier to keep playing the game than it is to turn it off you know because when you restart there's no like go to a loading screen go to a menu hit new game hit this you know it's just like nope you're back into it and yeah i i really like that yeah. about it i thought that was a, an interesting design concept too because when i was playing the game i kind of got this feeling like oh it's almost like you're playing a game where you're like in hell because it's you're fighting all these <laughs> demons 
and eventually you're gonna die but you're just gonna be right back in hell fighting more demons you know <laughs> yeah. <You're Sisyphus. laughs> the yeah. cycle yeah but then again like talking about like kind of designs that i think are kind of similar to that not necessarily inspirations for tormentor but i mean as i know that you guys are heavy into board games uh stuff like magic the gathering hmm. in a sense where it's a game where you make a deck you have it like a build in your mind you make a deck you play you lose you're like oh okay i need to just change this and this then you try it again it's kind of similar hmm. it's yeah. really similar in a sense to skateboarding sometimes you skateboard you're at the park let's say a skate park or a spot and you try something you're like okay let's say the round is too rough and if you're uh, lucky enough to have this total run example i've never done this myself but like <laughs> if you're like skateboarding something you can just change the wheels to like bigger or softer wheels and suddenly the ground is not that bad to you. it's kind of similar to magic where you can you know just shuffle the deck like change these cards take another cards and bam, boom you're back in the game trying hmm. something different yeah which is also kind of like a nuclear throne where you get to like <clears throat> choose your path sort of a thing and like find a find something that works for you to get through the level yeah, yeah, that, and that's that a like... huge inspiration for me as well. JW from Lambir, like his game, like Blue Trousers was a huge inspiration for Tormentor. Less so than Nuclear Throne, oddly enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, yeah. Adam, did you want to ask the next, que next question? Yeah, so I guess uh, what I'm kind of wondering is you're you're into these games and stuff now. Is that kind of your long term goal? Are you are you a game guy and specifically like indie games, or are you looking to maybe branch out and do more? Uh, I don't know, music for movies or voice acting, uh, film that kind of thing. Or what's your wow. what's your long term goals? Yeah, actually, it, uh, I forgot to mention a whole piece of my <laughs> life from my introduction, <laughs> but. Um... Um, yeah, I, I, indeed, I studied uh, movie, movie sound design, or like uh, like movie sound uh, assisting and stuff like that. And I did a bunch of like short movies and a few longer movies as well. And while I enjoyed that, I just, to me, video games were more compelling. Like this, what right. I like about video games more is, of course, it's also cool in movies because movies are linear. You have the starting and ending point are always the same. Uh, but in games that can change. What if the player decides to jump around for five minutes or keep on <laughs> opening a door again and again and again or try to do something yeah. just, like weird? Yeah, and, that dynamic yeah. Uh, element. Yeah. yeah, and then I remember kind of vividly playing, was it Skyrim? I think? Yeah, Skyrim. I was playing mm -hmm. Skyrim, the Elder Scrolls game. And then I pushed the stone and it kind of rolled down. I was like, ah, oh, that's cool like i started, i don't know why but that that rock kind of gave me a feeling or i think it was a rock or, or something some kind of object rolled down a cliff i was just looking at it going down like boom, boom, boom. i was like i would never see that in a movie that the character suddenly one time out of 50 times watching a movie would just stray from the path and kick a rock down <laughs> and that kind of got me like i was like ah oh, that's that's the thing. That's what I like about games, having that small, weird interactions like that. And when I worked on my first commercial game, uh, which is called Badland by Frogmind Games, hmm. which is the silhouette uh, iPhone, iPad game. Uh, well, mobile game. Um, and that you have lots of like physics interactions. And when I was just making sounds for these physics, physics interactions, it's really interesting to see how suddenly the game just or the world of the game became alive and it was alive in a different way than in a movie because this was all something that you could interact with and it would create these sounds and that was you know i was hooked ever yeah, since so, right. so. yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that because i i like to do like 3d art and stuff but for me it's all about that like interactive element like when you can take what you made and then do something with it and mm -hmm. and empower other people to to use your creation for whatever means mm -hmm. there's something that's just so much more satisfying about that than than having like a static creation uh, which i yeah. think is kind of what you're saying um this does kind of bring up another question that i had for you um 
I noticed uh, just kind of uh, Googling you the other day, I, I saw on your Twitter that you were out recording forest sounds. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, it is indeed. <laughs> so is that that kind of like fully work and that kind of thing? Is that something that you like to do often? And and I've seen before uh, fully artists uh, often kind of creating and making up sounds. Is that something that do you typically yes. try and go to the source or are you more of a like, oh, I'm going to find something that I think sounds like this? I, I guess the question is like kind of what's your process for, for creating those kinds of sound effects and things? Yeah, for sure. I like to just, um, how would I make this into proper words? Let's see. Um, so uh, with sound design or with sound people, we have a bunch of stuff like sound libraries where you're using sounds that our people have created and you start to implement them into your work. I personally don't like that approach. Like I've seen so many movies, played so many games, and I've always heard the same sound effects. And right. to me, that's boring. It suddenly doesn't become that world. Suddenly mm -hmm. it's kind of borrowing the elements from our worlds, if that makes sense. In my yeah. weird mind, it makes sense. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I've always been more into recording stuff myself, if possible. And also recording internal sound banks where I'm st I've started to kind of replace commercial sound banks that I've used with my own sound banks. So that mm. they're just, you know, originally it's something that I made and also for my own curiosity of creating stuff and finding kind of new elements. It's just interesting. It's like genuinely interesting. That's why I do that. But with games and stuff, um, indeed, I have like a uh, portable recorder. I would just go outside and record a bunch of stuff. Like now I'm working on a game called Atomic Crops. Okay. And I'm creating like the forest sounds for it. So I just, you know, I drive to the forest, record a bunch of forest sounds like birds, uh, ambiences with birds and like trees and wind and stuff. Then I would take that back to the studio, and I have like a bunch of uh, bird whistles and stuff like that, and I would kind of add more birds and more kind of alien oh, or weird cool. sounding animals with nice. those. And just using your vocals, to, like like a distant lion, you can hear a small roar. I'm just going like, right back into the studio <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> That's cool. So nice. is this, um, do, you, do you do a lot of like, because uh, I know you'd mentioned earlier cassettes. Are you doing this on cassettes or are you doing like a digital recording and then kind of taking it in and, and pulling out parts of it or do you just digital only add for sure. to it? <laughs> digital for sure. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that it would be much more difficult to try and do like analog recordings in this era. <laughs> yeah, I mean then again like I do use cassette and um, like vinyl tape for stuff. Uh, depends, like we work in a game called Don Katana which sadly never got released and I have no idea what's happening with the project now but on that one we used a cassette recorder for uh, all the sword sounds and stuff okay. we would record like like metal going like and all that stuff record that through a cassette and then record that output and it just becomes more oh, uh, yeah, get... greedier this is yeah. the quality of the sound that's different that's so hard to emulate and right. also you can like adjust the pitch live so you know you record like a shing and you take the pitch button and you go like shing, 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 and you can do stuff like that <laughs> okay so cool uh, <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know it, I, there's no this is what i always do kind of thing it's always you know on the spot sure. like inspiration <laughs> cool uh if we can get a little technical for a bit um what kind of gear do you use like what kind of microphone mm -hmm. and recorder Okay, so um, for the outdoor stuff, I have a Sound Devices 744T. T comes from time code, so you can sync it up with cameras mm. if you want to do, you know, movie stuff. Um, then I use Sennheiser MKH60 microphones outside usually. And and then on the studio itself, I'm running a Pro Tools HDX system, which is all run by my laptop and like external uh, digital processors. Oh, okay. And oh, and I also use like Genelec listening. I've always used, I mean, Genelec is Finnish, so it kind of makes sense for me to use Genelec. <laughs> as, you know, it's easy to get here. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Yeah. 
Um, oh, and for yeah. Rosal stuff, I oh, use yeah. a Neumann U89. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. So you, you use a different microphone for outdoor recording versus like indoor studio recording? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like just getting into sound stuff, so I don't really know a lot. Um, there are different microphones. Like the U89 is a large diaphragm condenser, condenser mic. Okay. When the M860 is a small, and they have different polar patterns. So it kind of depends on what I'm recording. Mm -hmm. But this actually is a good good entrance to another kind of thing when coming into microphones or recorders and pre and stuff like that. Um, as an example for nuclear throne, I would use different microphones for different things so that they are sonically different oh. from the get-go. Oh, so cool. the characters all use the U89, the Neumann U89 for vocals, mm -hmm. except the enemy characters would use a TLM 102 microphone. So they had different microphones for enemies and players. So that's the sonic really quality is different. That's really interesting that you would make like such a subtle change, but mm. I'm sure it has an impact on on players that, that they don't even know what it is. Yeah, it's it's kind of it, it makes enemies sound a bit different. There's something small and <laughs> different about them, which kind of makes at least like, this is what I want to believe that happens is that subconsciously you are like, oh, that's a different source. I kind of, it's a different quality to it. I know it's an enemy right. or it has this quality to it. It's something happening to me. I don't know. That's kind of <laughs> what I hope really is cool. happening, but I don't know. And I also use different pre-amplifiers for both of them. Oh, okay. So the players use a SSL pre-amplifier when then again, the enemies use the M-Box, which is a cheaper cheaper preamplifier no that, that's cool i like that idea it's kind of kind of reminds me of like um you see sometimes in indie films they'll use different cameras or different lenses mm, to get mm, different things mm. like instead of exactly you know instead of doing it in post process and digital they just do it all in the camera exactly that's the exact same thing like the microphones are the lenses mm -hmm. the recorder is the camera system itself yeah that's cool yeah all right, uh, so we'll start talking about Tormentor and Punisher, I guess. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> um, uh, so Tormentor X Punisher definitely has a specific aesthetic, both sonically and visually. How did you kind of like pull all that together? Where did that Where did that come from? Um, so uh, a lot of people ask like for my inspirations for Tormentor X Punisher, mm -hmm. and it's kind of fun to say that it's not really that video game inspired. <laughs> except the whole core concept comes from me wanting to make a Geometry Wars clone for years. Even years before Tormentor, I wanted to make a Geometry Wars clone game. <laughs> Which feels horrible to say, but I guess <laughs> mimicry is the best way to learn something. Yeah. Just make something in the vein, and then it becomes something different. So I always wanted to make a Geometry Wars game, and I tried like Unity and Unreal and like different tools like this to make it kind of nice and pretty. But they never felt right. They always felt like clones. But I guess I learned something out of this. And then I just decided to make it myself first. I just sat down, opened Game Maker. And I was like, I'm going to make it top down. Like a top down shooter in Game Maker style instead of like Unity or Unreal. Mm -hmm. So it's that like all, you know, different tools, different mindset kind of thing. And I started making it. And then, um, then I talked about it with my friend Tuka Stefansson. And he was like, oh, let me do art for it. And we just jammed together and he helped me out with some code stuff. And and he also made the final graphics for the commercial game version as well. So we just started jamming together and we started turning into this demon shooter thing. And, you know, here we are, it's released. <laughs> um, so so when, you, when you're working on that, like um, you just mentioned that he was doing some of the visuals and stuff, did mm -hmm. you... How do you guys like balance your your visuals with the audio? Did you do? Did you kind of get the gameplay down first, and then build visuals on there, and and then bring in the audio, and then kind of like retouch everything, or like what's your process for balancing out? You know, audio drives video, or or visuals drive audio. It's that's a good question, uh, but that kind of actually brings me back to inspiration. As I mentioned, like the game wasn't really in the end that inspired by games. It was pushed forward by Geometry Wars, but then 
I started getting into more into like Adult Swim stuff and and like different comic books like Prison Pit. Prison Pit was probably the single biggest inspiration for Torment Rex Punisher, alongside uh, Super Jail, like and <laughs> King Star King and stuff, and Turtles, the Turtles uh, animation series from the eighties. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from the eighties. Yes. Nice. Yes. Yeah, that was a huge. It's still like everything I do with a pretty huge inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, these were like kind of the main inspirations, and then anime like Berserk and stuff like that, uh, Trigun, Desert Punk, and stuff like that. And I would go through these with Tuka, and he was into these things as well. So we kind of had the visual style down together. Like we knew what it's gonna kind of sound and look like, just you know, based on these series right. kind of that, that imagery. Mutual... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, That's and cool. the one thing is, most of the sound effects and even like a lot of the music were done before turning the game into a commercial product. That's just from our jams, because we kind of knew what it's going to sound like, so or like look like, and we kind of just ran with it. <laughs> so when we met with Raw Fury, our publisher, we had a pretty good kind of prototype running already, and it features the same sounds and music and stuff. And it's kind of funny because uh, I talked about this with Raw Fury. We had a one year anniversary with Torment Rex Punisher last month. No, wait, this month. No, two weeks ago. <laughs> two weeks ago, we had a <laughs> we had a one anniversary stream with Torment Rex. And like, they were remembering stuff like, oh, we heard the music and sounds. They were the same on the prototype or whatever. And I was like, yeah, actually, that's true. Yeah, we made most of the leg work by just, you know, jamming in our underwear and making it. Fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> you met, excuse me. You mentioned uh, Adult Swim and Super Jail earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I definitely see that influence, especially in like the intro animation for Tormentor mm. Punisher. Um, how much did that influence that animation, or like what other kind of influences <sighs> influence that uh, yeah, little yeah. bit of animation? I'm so happy we got to make that. I always <laughs> like. Oh, no. Actually, I'm gonna hold that question. I'm gonna okay. jump back just a bit when Adam asked me. It was Adam, right? Adam. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Adam asked me about like future goals and stuff. Oh yeah. And the past few years, I've been really into drawing and making it small animations and stuff like that. Like I'm not sure if you saw the Torment Rex Punisher Christmas animation that was made by I made that myself and. I've been super into just drawing, painting, drawing, animating, and stuff like that. So I kind of wish that in the future, at some point, I would have enough money and time to just make my own animations for a while, or like comic books, or just visual art in general. Mm -hmm. So when I got to do the animation for Tormentor, that was that's a, a sum of a lot of things coming together. Uh, out of which one was getting John Vermilee, our promo artist, on board. Uh, he was a friend of Bo's, Bo Blythe, uh, our programmer, and we were looking for a promo, like promo art artist, and I wanted uh, Johnny Ryan from Prison Pet to do our promo art, <laughs> <laughs> which would have been a long shot, but you know, worth time. Yeah. And Bo was like, "Oh, I have a friend who knows him. Uh, do you want to see his art? He makes art as well." And I looked at John's art and I was like, oh, yes, this is the guy. Like, we are not contacting Johnny Ryan. We have, let's ask your friend. This is perfect. And then he asked John and we had a meeting. And then I realized, wait a minute, John's works on a lot of stuff like Adventure Time, Rick and Morty and stuff like that on the animations as well, I think. And oh yeah, in the animations as well. And I was like, oh, wow, um, I wonder if you could make like an animation for trailer and intro, then we talked with John and he was like, yeah, sure. I'll get my friend David Gemmel to join him. And then I got the budget approval from our publisher, Raw Fury, and then we got to make the animation. <laughs> wow, that sounds like quite, nice. a, quite a bit of luck, but also a, a, a fun process. Oh, for sure. And like, it was so much fun. Like I did, I made the storyboard first, just to, you know, go through like, basics that kind of what the game story 
feels like to me and i just wrote down this small storyboard and then i gave that to john and then he kind of tweaked it and made it way better and i was like yeah this is gonna be this is gonna be tight <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so much fun that's really cool yeah you can kind of get that you kind of, I kind of get that super jail vibe too, just from the gameplay, because it's like just mm. you know this rapid fire murder, <laughs> murder yeah. mayhem kind of a thing. It, that was always my favorite part in Super Jail was the 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 periods where they would do those animations of just like everybody Slaughter. getting ripped yeah. apart, and it was just like one giant acid trip of <laughs> of murder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, it that flow, it's got that flow, you know, where it's just like it doesn't mm -hmm. stop. Everything's very smooth. Uh, mm. and and you kind of get that from the gameplay when you just you get in the zone and it's just like things are exploding you don't really see what's going on it's just all kind of there <laughs> just one visual playing out in front of you yeah thank you i mean that's a good comp nice compliment thanks <laughs> uh, but the thing is like that's that's what i enjoy about super jail i wanted to bring to summer exactly that like the hecticness of like oh, limbs coming up and we actually wanted to do more of that in the game but then we decided to kind of cut down on that stuff just because of time and effort. Mm. <laughs> but um, but that's the thing, like with Super Jail, it's super gory and dumb. And that's the thing, it's dumb in a fun way. It's not like realistic. It's not trying to be realistic and like gross. And you're like, oh, oh, I can't watch this anymore. It's more of a fun thing. Like, oh, look at that person's arm coming up and slapping another person who drops into <laughs> acid and turns into an acid monster or something. You know? Yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. dumb fun. And that's what I want to do with Tormentor. And that's a super double, kind of a double-edged sword, if you, if you may. Uh, like, there are people who get it. Like, I would say 50% of the people get it, that it's more of a dumb, fun thing. Like, it's not being serious. Mm -hmm. But then 50% don't get that. And they hate the game because of it. They're like, oh, it's just an edgy, ugh, yeah, edgy, they, trying yeah. to be out of my lens. But then, like, as soon as people play it, they kind of go, oh, okay, it's not being serious. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Army of Darkness or something like that, where it's yeah. like, mm. it's it's fun, it's almost like campy, it's not, you know, it it's mm -hmm. a joke, but it's self-aware of that, but mm -hmm. it's still good, you know, it's like, it's, it's that balance between like, okay, what can we pull off and what can we like get away with, uh, you know, but still have a good game uh, that's yeah. entertaining. Yeah. And this thing is like, I don't like it. This is a lot of people. I get this question a lot like that. Like, oh, do you like violence? I'm like, no, like, actually, I don't <laughs> like violence. Like when I see a game that doesn't present violence, it's like they come up with a system that doesn't have violence and it's still fun. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, this is this is genius. But, you know, then again, like I like the dumb violent stuff like Super J or Prison Pit, but it's not being violent because violence. <laughs> it's just being violent because it's stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's such a weird it's such a tough one. Very tough <laughs> balance. <laughs> That's why with animation we try to make the animation more whimsical to kind of kind of go like, hey, look at it, it's not that violent, but it's still violent to push the feeling forwards that we want to kind of present. Yeah, yeah, so did that kind of drive some of the, the theme of your your storyline too? Because it is like, oh, we're going to kill a bunch of demons and stuff. So like, did you mm. make the conscious decision to say like, oh, well, if we make them demons, people won't care as much because they're, you know, they're the bad guys. Like, let's let's do whatever we want to them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, no, this is, uh, I'm just trying to remember my old notes and... This is gonna sound super horrible. Originally, I wanted, like, we knew it's gonna be demons from, like, you know, the get go to mm -hmm. day minus one. But I had a period of time where I was like, what if you are the demon and you fight against uh, humans? That's <laughs> funny. And, yeah. I was like, and I was like, I kind of want to do it. But then I was thinking about, like, weird designs and stuff. Like, no, 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 let's keep the demons. We yeah. are, we, we've already made them. But let's keep yeah. the demons. But I had the, like, I, Almost the whole development, I had this idea of maybe taking away all of the violence and making it more. So like just beat him with a wiffle ball like, bat. <laughs> <laughs> you still shoot the fuck out. Um, you still shoot them, but um, 
front instead of like blood and gore, it would be kind of more weird. Like okay. like instead of like bullets and like like you know like traditional bullets would shoot like something else and like instead of ex <laughs> enemies exploding into sort of uh, like uh, Diablo where they have the level where it's like all unicorns and happy things and stuff like that. In a sense, or like Goner, if you know this game called Goner, hmm. G O N N E R, it's another game published by Rock Fury, made by Ditto, and I kind of like how that game is not why that violent in the imagery it's more kind of trippy and weird and i like that and that okay. was like a huge inspiration of me trying to take the design somewhere else but again we have already been advertised the game as you know <laughs> mega right. uh, hyper right. violent dumb thing and i was like nah i'm gonna keep this this is our original <laughs> vision like sometimes you just have to keep that original kind of seed of thought that you had or right, something and just right. go with that instead of like changing it mid midway. Yeah, I see a lot of games nowadays, especially with you know the advent of early access and all that, mm -hmm. where they kind of stray from their, their original vision uh in order to satisfy maybe some of the the comments and critiques of the game. Mm. Would you would you say that you're very affected by uh, the commentary and the critiques of your game, or or do you kind of just like say, hey guys, look, this is what I'm developing, and if you like it, you like it, you don't, you don't, or like to what extent do you uh, outside opinion to influence your game? That, that's a very good question in the sense of there are <coughs> oh, sorry the differences between kind of making a game to someone as a order or making a game yourself and then presenting that to others. And Tormentor wasn't order to fit, it was here's money, make your game. So with Tormentor, I didn't care about the comments. <laughs> I just made like my, well, we made our game. And the only comments that mattered to me were purely like, technical things asking someone else oh can you play this game and like tell me how the controls feel mm -hmm, stuff sure. like that or talking within the team but even within the team sometimes you have like like you know someone's like oh we should totally make it this way man that's kind of the point where you have to be the horrible person go like no 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 <laughs> this is the vision let's go that way <laughs> yeah but luckily we didn't have we didn't really have that in tournament. It's probably more of like a technical thing of can we actually make this thing happen? Or should we just dull it down and make this thing that we know that we can make happen? So we just went with the thing that we knew that we could make happen. Of course, we originally wanted to make the game in half a year. And which is a really short time to make a game. Yeah. yeah. Evidently so. Like we tried to do, like we got the game ready in half a year. Then we had almost another, well, no, we had another half a year of just adding stuff like localization and making sure the game works on computers that, frankly, shouldn't be out anymore. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah, but that's and for, like, future stuff as well. Like, I'm designing another game, and I have the idea in my head, and, like, again, quite frankly, I don't, care about comments or seeing what other people are making <laughs> because I have this idea in my head and I want this idea to be realized. This is really narcissistic in a sense, but then again, like if you look at like Quentin Tarantino's films, mm. I'm not comparing myself to Quentin by the way, <laughs> but like Quentin Tarantino's films, you can see that they are his films. You right, you know, from even without yeah. seeing his name, you, you know like the style, so yeah. you're kind of building up your own, your own unique exactly. style. Yeah, that's kind of, that's what interests me with, like, stuff from, like, Cactus. Like, since Hotline Miami 2, there's been pretty much nothing really, like, uh, we don't know what he's making, but I know whatever he's making is going to have his style in it. And I can't right. wait to see what he's doing now kind of yeah. thing, you know? I, I want to see him. I don't care about... If he makes a battle royale game and he's, you know, been reading comments of this most marketable thing, I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. This is not what I'm waiting for. But if it's like, you know, something, I don't know, space aliens from Moon are 
batting to each rock. So I'm like, oh shit, that's you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's one of the interesting aspects of indie game design is it it kind of it almost forces you like just the the environment of trying to sell you know a game that will appeal to people is is hmm. you have to have some kind of style to set you apart from from the crowd um, mm -hmm. you know and, and then you can appeal to that specific audience and keep them coming back so mm. it sounds like you're all set up for tormentor x punisher 2 where the humans are getting just destroyed <laughs> by <laughs> actually, actually, no, I don't really want to talk about this coming thing because it's not, it's still, it's it's very infancy mm -hmm. of a million papers with notes in it, <laughs> which sure. is how I do all of my projects. I start with notes, I just start writing down notes and even with like sound design and stuff, I just write notes and when it's time to execute these plans, then it's super easy to just execute the plans. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, the next game is going to be completely different to Tormentor if this is going to be the game that I'm going to take forward. This one, this one is going to be Void. There's going to be no violence whatsoever. Oh, that's it's going cool. to be cool. And that's really hard, actually. I noticed, like designing games, it's surprisingly hard to come up with a game without violence, without killing anything. Mm -hmm. Like even Super Mario, if you think about it, <laughs> it's really brutal. You jump on other people's heads and they <laughs> die and you get their money. <laughs> it's, it's very <laughs> grotesque. Do you think about yeah, it? Yeah. Well, oh, you, like, it's you eat the fire flower and you shoot fire, you melt people. That's like, <laughs> uh, that's really brutal. Push someone in magma, like, uh, it's like, it feels like the most kid friendly game, but in the end, it's not really. It's, showing that you can jump on people's heads to steal their money. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, uh, I'm curious. I'm, I'm loving that world outlook. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you talked about like making games that are interesting but still have no no uh, violence in them. Uh, hmm. Have you ever tried this game called Valley? Valley? No, I don't so think so. It's, it's interesting. It's, a, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a puzzle platformer. And it has combat in it, but like the way the combat works is you have this suit that can spit out um, basically like a life force. And so mm -hmm. the combat is like you're infusing life force at these like spirits that have become corrupted. And when you defeat them, you're actually like releasing their spirit to be mm. good again. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's really that's, interesting. That's kind of you shooting at them. I You're definitely shooting at of. them, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, okay, it's good for you. <laughs> kind of, Take it's, your it's medicine. Really, yeah. <laughs> but that's really good. I just, I just Googled it on the background. Uh, it looks really good. I've, I've never heard of it before, so I'll check it out. But um, yeah, but then again, that's again, that's my mindset of not having anyone shoot at anything, you know, no, none of that. It has to be okay. a game where there's zero violence. Like, it's, it's surprisingly yeah. hard. I have are to you make a game that's fun like that? Are you thinking like no combat at all? Yes. Okay. In a sense, in a sense, it depends. It's a definition of combat. It depends okay. what what is combat. Is skateboarding a combat? Hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Hmm. I mean, it could be. You know, it depends on how far you want to take it. Because you know, there's the violence of falling and breaking your head on the ground or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's a yeah. Of course, you can exactly. soften those blows, but. Yeah, you're right. I never really thought about it, but there's, uh, I almost can't really think of a game. I mean, even things like Stardew Valley or, or yeah, Minecraft yeah. or something like that, there's still a component of violence there, even though they're very, you know, kid friendly. Yeah. Uh, huh. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. That's it is really hard. That's quite a challenge. Yeah. yeah, it is. And it's really fun to kind of think of that challenge and kind of run with it and then finding the thread like I'm at that point of pants where I know that it's not violent like I okay. taken violence away but then it becomes definitions what is kind of I, I, I don't know I don't know I'm, I'll talk about it later <laughs> sure, okay, sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah we know we, we would love to have you back on the show when you're ready to talk about it more <laughs> oh yeah for sure yeah yeah, what were we talking about? Nah, we were talking about something else before. Um, I was like mumbling about 
violence. I did, I did the start, I don't remember. <laughs> oh well. Oh yeah, oh well. That's um, like when I talk, I kind of branch out everywhere. It's, no, that's, uh, that's perfect. I I, that's perfect for the show. I love doing that. We've gone on so many tangents on like, you know, we just end up miles away from where <laughs> we started. Yeah. Uh, Adam, I think you had a question about making sound effects with just like voice and vocal release. Yeah, so to what to what extent do you kind of just uh, make up sounds and just voice them yourself? Um, that seems like it would be really challenging to somebody like me who, who doesn't know anything about sound effects and, and doesn't have really that vocal talent. But uh, I guess that you kind of just do some of your own sounds off the cuff. Are you... Are you walking around the grocery store just making weird noises and freaking people out? Or like, how's that? What's the process for that? The thing is, I think everyone does that to an extent. <laughs> Have you ever, um, let's say, as an example, if there's like a cat or a dog or another person, have you ever booped them and go like, boop? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah, already I, you're doing. Go I like on. to squawk at the geese when I drive by. Don't tell yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when, you do, <laughs> when you do stuff like that, you're doing that thing already. And it's weird because uh, I use vocal as effects a bunch. Always, always use it. It's, um, it's very natural, I would say. Like, I remember when I started out doing sound design, and I was like, how do I make this sound? Like, in my head, it goes like, Whoa. I was like, wouldn't oh. I just record I'll just that. do that. <laughs> yeah, and then right. do that, and then I start like using the vocal as a guide track. And I would then kind of replace different elements of that sound with the actual sounds. Okay. And then yeah, when we'll I see, took the vocal away, take it in. yeah, when I took the vocal away, I was like, but now it's missing kind of the body or glue that kept all of this together. Mm -hmm. So I just start leaving those vocals in. And then, um, when I started working on Nuclear Throne, uh, we had these like live streams every week. It was it like, two streams per week or something like that? And I would do my audio streams. I would do that same thing, and people were like, "Wait a minute, you're doing sound effects with your vocal?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, I kind of use it as kind of a guide track." But then, just for some things, it was just easier to just use your vocals, like stabbing sounds or gross slime sounds. <laughs> so uh, I used to do like slime sounds a lot with like pudding or soap or random stuff like that. Just going like <laughs> on a bowl or whatever. <laughs> but I realized it's really hard to control. Hmm. Like it's more random than using your vocals. Like something that you've always used in your life. It was easier to control the shape of my mouth and how the sound is coming out. So like stabbing like... <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> just use your vocals. It's super easy. I mean, you put it on a microphone, and if you like time stretch or like pitch, uh, like pitch shift the vocal or time stretch or something, kind of you lose the human vocalness of it, and it starts just become a cool sound effect. Or sometimes even just using your just your vocals like that, and leaving it works. Like I'm working on a game called Bleak Sword at the moment and that's like 90 percent just me doing sounds with my mouth <laughs> <laughs> and it's really fun it's and it's one of these things that you can't really if you didn't know it you wouldn't hear it <laughs> right right it's fun it's yeah. just you know it's a tool that we've always used since birth oh like most people have used since birth it's just something that we know how to use and uh, as a kid, I was really inspired by Police Academy, <laughs> the, the movie movie series. Yeah, um, that's... His, what's his name? Like Michael Winslow? I, uh, I know who you're, I know yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he came to mind when I was thinking of this question because I was like, I wonder if he's just sitting around making like helicopter noises and stuff. All yeah. Day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, as a kid, I was sure that it was fake. I was so sure it's fake, but. Growing up, I realized, oh, wow, it's not fake. He's yeah. actually doing this stuff. And he was, I mean, it inspired me a lot. And like, I've used my vocals in music production a bunch too. It's just, sometimes it's just, it's the right timber for something. Mm -hmm. But I kind of hate the fact that it's become a kind of a gimmick, expected gimmick out of projects that I work in. And I'm like, oh no, I kind of, there's a part of me that's like, just don't use vocals on this project. <laughs> when I, in the heat of just making stuff, like, ah, oh, 
quickly, quickly, I need slime sounds. And then I just naturally, I turn the microphone and press record and go like, <laughs> stuff like that. And I'm like, that's it. Like, it's done. <laughs> right. Yeah. I bet, I bet a lot of people do it and we just don't realize it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just come to light. And yeah. And I was like, oh, he's the voice guy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now everyone's going to be super self-conscious when they're like squawking at the geese or, you know, making noises at their yeah. dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or they'll just feel a little less weird because they'll know yeah. other people are out there doing <laughs> They'll be like, I should record this and make a video game from it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And everyone does it. Like, everyone does their own versions of like, boop, sound or like yeah. just going like, oh, just, just, let's fry it. And you're like, oh, okay, really fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Um, well, I'm I'm out of questions. Adam, do you have anything else you wanted to talk about, or uh, or, uh, or Jonas? <laughs> ooh, um, I'm totally not looking at a list of questions in front of me. So, um, <laughs> voice acting. There's a question about voice acting. Uh, are oh, there yeah. any tricks or special steps you take to get ready to record? And that depends 100% on the project. Like Pro Force, I had, it was like 90% scripts, and then I would add 10% of like improvisational things. So I did the announcer in Pro Force, actually all of the voice acting in Pro Force, except for female characters, mm -hmm. which was Isa And, who's worked with me on a bunch of games. Um, so like, um, there's a few that are kind of funny. Like there's a Pro Force trailer for uh freedom day or something like that in america or something like that i can't remember and bro force is a funny project because it's made by south africans and a finnish person and we are making the most american game <laughs> wait did, did you say a finnish person or a finnish persian a finnish person uh oh, okay. person like me, as okay. in me. <laughs> i thought you meant someone that was half finnish and half persian i was like that's interesting oh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm half Finnish, half English. So mm. less, less interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, so yeah, it's kind of funny thing. We made like this freedom update for Rogue Force. And on that, one of the lyrics is like, I can remember what I shout. It's like, like, taste the freedom. I did like things like that. I was like, what the fuck is this? And I just send it to them. That's and then the trailer comes out and that's the voice clip that they use. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah. So do you do oh, yeah. like a couple of takes and then just kind of let them pick or how does... Mm. Or yeah, you... I, yeah, I kind of pick them and then I send a bunch of variations and then people use what they use. Well, that's the case with Grow Force. But um, on Nuclear Throne, on the other hand, that's where I would write the scripts myself. And on Nuclear Throne, I made a language for the game, which is like written and spoken language that the inhabitants use in the game. Uh, and that one was like just me writing down lyrics per character and when I do characters I usually write like mood charts for characters like in Nuclear Throne all of the characters sound different they have different personalities we would talk about their pasts and current situations and how I could depict that with vocals That's and really I just cool. write down yeah it's You're kind of like fun. method acting uh, <laughs> yes these individual characters <laughs> yeah and on some characters like Fish on Nuclear Throne, I would try to impersonate the physical nature of the character. Like Fish has like very kind of like fishy, like loose, like raw lips kind of thing. Right. <laughs> That's my vocal depiction of Fish. So I would hold, I would like take my hands and grab my um, cheek right there. So now my mouth was like very horizontal. <laughs> and I would talk like that. And I would always have the craziest, like, uh, bruises on my uh, cheek <laughs> from doing that. Oh, I wish this was a video chat now. <laughs> right? That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So I would do the characters like that. That was, like, pretty method, like, method acting. <laughs> Clear prone. And, yeah, that's kind of how I like to do characters. But then some games I just wing it myself and then I send those on. Like on Bleed 2, a game called Bleed 2 that I did sounds for as well. On that, then again for vocals, like most character vocals, I would use like random sources or guitars and stuff like that. So like all the robots in Bleed 2 kind of use guitars as their vocals. This mm. is really fun. 
and stuff like that. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. It's very interesting to hear your process because I, you know, I don't really know anything about sound design or, or how these things kind of come together. So just hearing your process, it's, it's very enlightening uh, to hear how much of it is really just sort of intuitive, like, like, you know, mm. just the, the making sounds with your voices and stuff like you're right. It's very, it's like instinctual, uh, you know, babies make weird noises. It's, you know, it's yeah. something that we do from the time we're born. So it, it really makes sense. Uh, it's, it's almost strange that you don't think about it more often. It's, it's kind of one of those things like it's so common that it's, it's just, you, you never even have the thought like, oh yeah, we could just uh, make this sound or whatever. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh that, oh, that reminds me, I get to talk about this subject forever. But um, <laughs> so like one thing when you're talking about sound, I talked about sound libraries earlier on. Mm -hmm. It's um, one thing that I, uh, just, that I just eats me from the inside. I hate <laughs> seeing this in games and movies where you have like, let's say a bear going like raw and you see the mouth movement, but the sound is from a library and doesn't follow the mouth movement. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. see that in like maybe 99% of movies, and I hate it. Same with video games. You see a bear and it's just, you know, you're like, that, 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 where did that vocal come from? <laughs> the upper end, you know? You're like, no. And that's another thing where, like, me personally, of course you can always kind of sometimes you just have to use a bear vocal from a library per client specs or whatever but um but i realized that i kind of wanted to remedy it by trying to emulate a bear for instance and i remember i had this one project that i sadly can't talk about but um i had this one project where they were like bears and i was like i'm not going to use a library all the bears have like five shared sound. No, 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 that's gonna suck. <laughs> so instead I started mimicking bears myself and just writing down, taking a picture of a bear, looking at videos of bears and coming up like, how do they produce their vocals? What's the difference between a bear and a human and stuff like that? And then I realized, okay, um, we, we don't have a nose or the facial shape of a bear. So I need to first off kind of get a facial shape of a bear to kind of make the sound resonate in a similar manner than a bear does. Of course, I'm not quite the size of a bear, but I'm getting there. And <laughs> I was using, then I realized, oh wait, I could use a toilet paper roll. That would kind of make my mouth a bit longer. I'll just put my hand like this, I don't my vocal quality is different than this. And that was, then I started just experimenting with that. So I started making bear sounds with toilet paper rolls or placing my hands in front of my like, mouth like this and stuff like that. And that was really interesting to me. And just kind of realizing that we can also mimic other creatures by just trying to kind of reproduce the way how they make sound. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Similar to similar to the fish man, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, how many days did you spend walking around with like your fuzziest blanket just on all fours, <laughs> eating cereal off the floor? Oh yeah, man. <laughs> Total nephodexing. <laughs> yeah. I am a bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. Like uh, also my co worker Neil Takalainen, who does a bunch of sound stuff with me. Uh, we both work at the same studio. Um, he does like, I, I can't do it myself. And this is kind of cool because different people can physically do different things. And he can do like a perfect kind of a bee vocal, like bees and flies, hmm. by kind of holding his lips in a certain way with his hands and just going like, and it sounds like a bee. And I'm like, my, my lips <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> I'm trying now. No, I just can't, I just can't do it. <laughs> It's, it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that sounds fun, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you really uh, enjoy your work. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it, it's. I mean, before making games or working full time on music stuff. Oh, I'm I'm used to work full time in music production and stuff hmm. before games. Uh, but like before all this stuff, like or even during that stuff, uh, work on so many weird jobs like post office work or 
working at a store or cleaning and stuff like that. So it's like, you know, going through all those steps to start to appreciate, like, hey, I'm making songs for a living. This is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it also brings, I, I, for that reason as well, it also brings, ch like, various challenges. And, like, if yeah. you think about, like, video games or even movies, especially movies in its, like, modern production way, an internet, which sounds really weird to say. Like, these things have changed all of this so much, so much that I can't wait. Well, okay, I probably won't be around then, but I can't wait a few, <laughs> like, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, no, I know the Finnish word. What's it in English? Um, like, like, from, like, the kids mm. of your kids. Like, a generation. Uh, I can't wait yeah, a few yeah, generations. generations. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> a few generations for... Um, of like people then making video game sounds or video games because the industry will be different. Yeah. So like now we have like small like like infancy step problems like people not understanding processes like people don't know how sounds are made which it to me is people know how 3D models are made. Yeah. They know how drawings are made and stuff like that. But for some reason, sound are always kept as a mystical mythical thing a magic like oh it just happens and that's i can't wait until people know how sounds are made and suddenly you can talk about like proper pay and like people know what they're paying for <laughs> like if i didn't know about sounds and there's a sound designer like oh it's going to cost you eight thousand i'm like what and well, trust me when I say there's plenty of people that don't understand that when it comes to 3D models either. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Just it's the same. Like, it's just yeah. art. You should do it because you love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't wait for that mentality, if ever. Uh, I'm sure it will. Like, I can't wait for that mentality to be, like, kind of become extinct and people realizing that, hey, this is also work. Yeah. And that's why I like doing, like, podcasts and as many interviews as I can regarding sound and talking about sound just to get, you know, people at hopefully a step closer to understanding what's happening. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're definitely putting in work. You're taking the time and effort to, uh, you know, walk around and pretend to be a bear. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's not something that everybody's doing. <laughs> yeah. But then again, it is something that's not only sound. You have like server programmers. Like you're like, why do they cost so much money? And then you see their work. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, it's... like even like into board games. Uh, I don't know why it felt like jumping into board games, but like even like <laughs> making board games, there's so many processes there that are you know just alien to people. Like you need to print the board game. You need to find a way like where to print them in. Yeah. Like scale that you need to print them out a lot where do you get the figurines from if you want figurines or like uh, small monopoly money where can you get like where can you get that and stuff like that there's so many steps that are just like mythical to people and it's kind of yeah. weird because like when you think about like dairy products you know where those come from and it's okay. kind of well you know, i think it's you, i think it's a big societal kind of shift from you know in the past people were were more involved in the process of making things you know nowadays yeah, oh, yeah. We're, we're a consumer society so it's it's never uh, oh i'm gonna make that it's oh let me go to the store and buy that and so mm -hmm. i think there's that shift in mentality has kind of made it hard for people to understand like oh it, to make something from scratch from nothing is is an involved process it, it requires knowledge and mm. skill and time and energy it's not you know not everything can be just made on a machine and then shipped mm -hmm. to your house for free you know in yeah. two days because you have amazon prime so mm. it, it is very uh enlightening for people i think to listen to you know people like you who spend their time kind of inventing new ways to create um mm -hmm. you know uh, and, and I think it inspires people because they realize, oh, hey, I, if, if this person can do that, you know, I can also go create something like when people, and, mm. and that's one of the things that I also find very interesting in like modern gaming is, is mm. whenever a game empowers someone to create, you know, an experience or content or 
or whatever, like even how we were talking earlier about the different styles of being able to play like Tormentor X Punisher, you know, mm. people realize like, oh, I can do this my way. So now they've they've mm. kind of taken on that mentality of the maker. They're they're involved in the process, and they, it, I think it, it draws them deeper into the content as well. It's like, okay, well, if I get to be involved in kind of creating this storyline, I, you know, I'm going to be more involved in the game. I'm going to be more in depth. It, it's it's that process of of turning from the consumer to the creator uh, yeah and that's one of the, the really interesting aspects of of what you do and and game design and playing games and and it's all very cool yeah yeah it's kind of a fun way like you put it in a fun way and i kind of i agree to that like um to me like when i play games i enjoy games where i can do the thing like like i can decide how i play the game how do I conquer this challenge? Like, uh, random example, like Nuclear Throne, or, uh, sorry, not Nuclear Throne, but like, well, Nuclear Throne, <laughs> or like Counter-Strike, or Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, or anything like that. It's kind of my decisions that um, bring me the result. Then there are like games where I have to follow someone else's thing and just, you know, replicate what they wish that you do. And I, I personally don't enjoy that. <laughs> Right. Well, like a new Super Mario game, I really like that game. And there's like ways that you can kind of, uh, um, what's the word? Like you can uh, complete the puzzle or the intended thing that you want to do, but you can do it in your own way. Like find another, another kind of approach to it. Like my yeah. friend Yukio, he posted a video on Twitter where he got like some star coin thingy mm -hmm. by just jumping on top of the hat, throwing the hat again, jumping on it found his own way of completing a puzzle and i'm like ah that's that's cool <laughs> yeah it's always yeah. interesting to see how like people kind of create unexpected things uh, like have you have you seen any of that with your own work where people have been playing like a game and and maybe they've done something that you never even intended or or thought about um... oh yeah yeah <laughs> uh, actually it's a tournament pun tournament as punisher they're like people you tell me their ways of getting upgrades in the game, and I'm like, oh, what? Does that work? <laughs> like, I had no idea that works. Or people, I, video games, I love seeing speedrun things, or people breaking the game without yeah. cheating. Like, they just, you know, it's that's in the game, that's legal in the game. Mm -hmm. And I hate, like, if the game allows you to do something like that, to me, it's not cheating. If you could do it in the game, it just means that was never tested. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, which, I mean, I know there's a lot of people who are going to kind of disagree with me on this, but I personally like when people kind of use small glitches of games uh, to their advantage. There's just something about it that I've always enjoyed. Um, and in Tournament X Punisher, someone noticed that they can kill bosses before they even spawn by punching on the spawner on the right frame. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Wow. Like, how? How? How did someone, huh? like, what? What does it take to someone to realize that you can do something like this? And it's like watching, like, um, Zelda 64, Ocarina of Time, like, speedruns. They're like, oh, I need to count, like, one, two, three, four, and do a backflip on the wall, and boom, I'm in the other side of the cartridge. And you're like, what? Yeah. How did you <laughs> figure uh, that uh, out? Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, there's something about that, that it makes video games more humane, or like more to me. Hmm. Like this, that, that, more, that um, error that's in there, the human mistake that's in there is what interests me a lot as well. Like when people complain about a game being broken, like, like finding stuff like that i'm like no nah, that's just you know humans made it and it's kind of cool that it has like it's a bit rough around the edges yeah, that's <laughs> neat i never, talking about it. never thought about it that way but that's kind of cool yeah yeah that yeah. is a really interesting way of of looking at it because it's kind of that you know oh it's again it's that handmade product it's yeah it's like mm. the little imperfections that make it unique mm. uh, yeah exactly very interesting. And I would it would be interesting to see like a completely computer made game someday and see are they perfect or but then again that's kind of human made machine making something 
but right. yeah, in the future, <laughs> in future right. generations from now, and see how clean are they clinical or would machines adopt error in their ways as well? Hmm. It's kind of interesting. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's no, that's cool. Kind of reminds me of a um, of a quote from a oh god, I can't think of his name right now. The guy who did um, Braid. Uh, Oh, turn them blue. Yeah, yeah. I think he said something once about like people didn't like his game because it was kind of um, like it's, it wasn't like friendly, I guess, kind of, or because you know, mm -hmm. like like Braid had themes of like alcoholism and abuse, mm -hmm. and um, he's like, yeah, he's like, but you know, if you if you just like sandpaper all the sharp edges off of everything, things kind of mm -hmm. become boring, you know, if they're too safe, and that yeah. kind of like it kind of made me think yeah. of that when you were talking. Yeah, I, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. And a way where I can see this is music production, hmm. where things have turned from, hey, let's be humans to let's be machines. Yeah. yeah. Which, and I don't personally enjoy that. Like, when you have someone tuning vocals all the time, just so it like, matches the pitch perfect drums that they program or synth lines or fake guitar lines. When people start tuning everything to be perfect, to me personally, it loses its value, musical value. No, it's just a technical masterpiece that I'm just listening, being executed through my speakers. And to me, that's, that's, that's no one's song read. Really. That's just technical marvelance. And that's right. not interesting to me. Like if you use, I, I enjoy when technic you use technical things and you make art out of it. But when it's just, you know, a calculated perfect product, eh, what's, there's nothing for me right. personally to grab into. Right. That's why, like, I love in listen to, like, 70s music a lot. Yeah. Especially, like, 70s electronic music. Because you can hear small, like, mistakes here and there. Well mistakes and mistakes Ooh, well, however people want to call them but to me it's just interesting it's like you can hear the composer doing something and right. that's what's interesting to me kind of goes back to that that whole theme of style you know it's like you yeah. you can wash away the style with with too much editing you know you want to leave some yeah. of that in there you want to leave the character of of the creator you want to keep that you know that that just a little yeah. extra something in there and yeah. it adds some kind of flavor to it that it's you can't yeah. put your finger on it but you know it's there it's it's like you know this is why people still listen to vinyl you know it, everything's available yeah. on digital but it's not the same mm -hmm. it's not quite got that thing yeah and this kind of brings me to my kind of style of creating sounds uh as opposed to like a lot of our like i've been to so many conferences and talk with like other scientists i'm not gonna like shit talk anyone over here i mean uh <laughs> talk bad of anyone like um there's sometimes i've noticed that there are people who just make sounds because they had fun making them and they're like oh it makes this quirky character alive and then there are people who are obsessed about the technical quality and like you know it has to be technically perfect and i've noticed that Usually their designs just simply do not interest me. <laughs> right. To me, it's not design anymore. Now it's just, you know, going for that technical excellency. And that's like, you know, sure, good, good for you. Like, I mean, <laughs> they're still making professional products. Like, like, it's okay. It's all cool. It's like, you know, it's their style. It's their way of making it. And, you know, it's good for them. But like, to me, hearing people... You just go for it they're like oh you can hear a bit of clipping and distortion well uh, so what if the actual thing becomes alive and it's fun who cares about the technical thing anymore like i i've never been a person of standards to me like if, if it's cool it's cool right <laughs> like, like like my works like i'm if you take like a spectrum analyzer or how many things are peaking like they're probably <laughs> the most unprofessional works out there but they have sold them they they are i'm not, I'm not talking of my like a big upping myself but these <laughs> like nuclear throne i think the characters they have their own life they are now you know you have these characters they're alive they do things it sounds quirky and fun but technically it's not it's definitely not you know 
oh, the most polished. Uh, let's put this ring over here, make sure it's with the Sony III RRRCC standard. Nah, fuck that. Just make it. If it's fun, it's good. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's another. I mean, that's another big thing with the you know indie games versus AAA. You know, it, it's kind mm. of AAA is is just okay. What's the most polished graphics you can make? What's the recipe mm. for the same game that we've been selling for ten years or whatever? You know, yeah. how do we how do we keep selling that same thing to people? Whereas you yeah. see a lot of these like innovative indie developers thinking of new ways mm. to do things and. Yeah, they're not they're not the most polished. They're not, you know, there's gonna be bugs, maybe they're not the most visually appealing, but they're interesting. Mm -hmm. They're still interesting. And yeah, and that's it's shown. I mean, people are buying these games, so it's showing that yeah, uh people do want that. People want some kind of new something, uh, whether or not it's yeah. polished or not, you know. Yeah, yeah, and there's always kind of the demand for someone creating something with their own hands. This is something about, like, I have, I'm the same. Like, I if I like, let's say, buy a piece of art from someone, to me, if it's a print, I don't want to buy it. To me, it's just a replica, perfect replication of something they made. I want to buy the thing that they made. Right. Okay. If that yeah. makes sense. Like when I do my own art stuff, uh, I don't do prints of them. Uh, if I sell them, they get the original. Hmm. That's that's what interests me. That's just something about because that's the thing that they had in their hands. That's the thing they were, you know, drawing and uh, doing their mistakes on. You know, it's this is something about holding it. Yeah, there's something valuable in in the uniqueness of of a creation, and uh, it always reminds. I always think of this guy. I don't know his name or anything, but. There was this guy who did origami. And he was like mm. an origami master, and he spent like ten years making this origami city, and he displayed it one time, and then after that he lit it on fire and let it burn out. And I was just, I was just so like amazed by that because I thought it was such an interesting thing. Like he took it to the extreme, where it's like, like you were saying, like okay, I won't make a print of this. So there's only one of them, so it's very mm. neat. But he took it to the extreme of like, okay, I'm gonna make this masterwork, 10 years, only a few people get to see it one time and then it's destroyed forever. Right. Like mm. it takes that uniqueness almost to, to like the highest level possible. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then again, I do, I mean, that's, if they documented that, it's really cool. If it's just, you know, one off for a few people, then you never know did it really happen or not. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. But that's the thing about like humans, I feel like there's a sense, not everyone has it, but some people have this sense of, you know, creating something that will be still around after, you know, their time has come. Yeah. Right. And there's just something that intrigues me about that as well. But then again, knowing making video games is something that will eventually disappear somewhere hmm. but you know there's just something about it creating so you, something that yeah. so you said you don't make uh when you sell artwork you don't make prints of the artwork you sell hmm. do you do you document them beforehand though like so you just have like a oh. digital gallery of yes. stuff you've printed yes. and stuff yes. okay yes. you course. don't just like yeah, kiss yeah. it goodbye and say so long no 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 yeah i'm too sentimental to do that right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no i, I get well, that i totally get that yeah, and I kind of have this thinking when I make sound effects as well. Like mm -hmm. when I create effects for a game, I will not use those effects again in anything else. Oh, that really? Maybe if there's a sequel wow. of the game. That's cool. That's, like, that's impressive because I would think you would keep everything in a library and have that for reuse. Uh, no. I'm, I'm highly surprised by that. Yeah, I kind of want every game to... Like when I plan on a game, of course I have sound libraries that I've made or... Mm -hmm. Board, which I'm trying to kind of get away from. Uh, but you know, I always make, I do make some libraries that I might take sound from the library into the project, but the actual sound from that project that goes towards a video game, I will never use, reuse those sounds. Oh, okay. Huh. So let's say like if I go to South Africa and record breaking rocks in a mountain, which actually happened, this is pretty fun. Uh, so, um, I could use those rock sounds on another game for like something, let's say a wall breaking down, like use them as layers and kind of create a wall breaking down sound. But that wall breaking down sound will only be for that game. Gotcha, gotcha. 
yeah. Cool. So it's like making tools, like let's say you make your own pen. That would be like the library, and then the actual final piece that I make with the pens, I would give on and never touch again. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so Adam, you had a question about the balance of uh, sound and music versus visuals in games, I think? Uh, well, I kind of wanted to ask you because uh, you'll you'll hear from filmmakers say like, oh, well, sound is, you know, this percentage of, of a film, like, you know, I've heard mm. as high as 90% of a, of a movie is mm. all sound. Um, so mm. I, do you kind of agree with that? And is it the same for games? Uh, would you say, I know you mentioned um, like controls were very important to you. So yeah. I guess what's, what, what do you find is the balance and importance for, you know, smooth, good sounds, uh, visuals, controls, uh, that kind That's, of thing? It's, I, I, I would argue that it's an impossible question in a general level, <laughs> but it's a more of a per project kind of thing approach. Like if you have a game that only has three sound clips, but it's like 70 hours in length and has like the most amazing visuals, in that case, sound is like 0.3% of the experience. But unless they're annoying, then they're probably 100% of the experience. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, like in a general normal kind of situation, like let's say nuclear from downwell or whatever, uh, I, I, I don't really know what to say. They are definitely more than most people think in a sense where, let's take, uh, for instance, Nuclear Throne. Uh, as we've been talking about, it's fresh in my mind. In Nuclear Throne, I used a lot of, or we used a lot of sounds to warn the player or inform the player. Like just the fact that we use different microphones or different things got kind of already gives a different feeling for the player for different actions. So just by hearing the game, they know what's happening, which yeah. means that the sounds are elevated in their importance. Uh, like when you're, uh, let's say, you pick up ammo or you're low on ammo, your character will yell out that you're low on ammo. You don't need to look at the UI, like, you know, your ammo counter or anything. You hear it by sound. You're like, oh, OK. Like, yeah, that's an interesting no point using audio cues in, in a game. Especially, yeah. it, it kind of comes back to that thing. Like, I, we place so much emphasis on, on visuals and, and visually, mm. you know, being able to, to detect things. I think a mm. lot of times we just don't really think about how how much uh, audio, you know, plays an important role in, in our experience, uh, you know? It, yeah, yeah. Our and our metrics punishers is the same. Because yeah. you're talking about all these I'm... ways that you can use it, and, and we don't even really think about it. like even like you were saying using the different microphones. Like I'm sure that mm -hmm. has an impact that we're not aware of. That that yeah. like you know you create that separation somewhere in your subconscious. Like oh that's that's good, that's bad. It's like little subtle things. Yeah, yeah, ex yeah, exactly. And like with new uh, tournament expenditure, the same thing is like I wanted the focus to be, and that was actually a fun thing to make design a game, a professional game from a sound design, like sound designer's uh, perspective, isn't Like, we wanted to focus in the game to be in the action and not the player looking at like an ammo counter or anything else, just look at the action. So we had like, mu we have the music in the game and the music goes down in volume until a boss spawns. So you don't really see that anywhere. You just hear it and you feel it like the soundscape changes and boom, a boss spawns. And you're like, yeah. oh, I knew something's going to happen because I <laughs> felt it. I heard it. I didn't see it necessarily, but, you know, just felt it. Yeah. And that's, again, that's 100% audio in that case. So it's, you know, the importance of audio for that specific moment is bigger than on something else. But when it comes to video games or movies, uh, to me, it's always felt weird that it's always about the artistical side or the clear artistical side. So like if you think about like movie visuals, like Star Wars, for example, I know George Lucas said that 50% is me, but I have to call bullshit on that. So I'm sorry, George, but that's the thing. <laughs> like, there are people who help finance the movie. What's their importance in making the movie? Pretty high, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, the movies wouldn't be there without someone paying for them. 
and concept artists. Part of the visuals is not what's depicted on the camera. It's someone coming up with the designs that they are capturing the camera. Someone building the props and stuff like that. So much stuff. Someone promoting the movie. If no one promoted the movie, you know, all of these would be 0% of value for the movie. But someone promoted it, it got into movie theaters, and, you know, on people's pajamas and all that stuff. It's, you know, so many different parts of the work that I feel like are kind of neglected when people give quotes like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 that is a really good point. All the behind the scenes things, Yeah. which, uh, maybe that's your unique perspective as as an audio designer you're you're more aware of those unseen <laughs> kind of things whereas the rest of us are just like oh what can i see yeah <laughs> yeah but that, that's the thing because like even people like even the day you can walk outside and see someone with a dark weight or t-shirt or something like that and you're like huh that made you think of star wars and that's someone's job to come up with that shirt and make sure that the shirt gives you a certain it's weird there's so many weird jobs out there like that that just don't get the light that they disturb or like video games we have people who are writing server codes making sure that servers you, people playing overwatch it's like you wouldn't play if someone didn't do the server stuff right, and that's a right. huge experience in the game instead of being super laggy you know like, oh, <laughs> now it's like oh like very smooth and that someone made that it's someone's doing that like a collective's doing so it like, runs like that <laughs> and that's a huge part of the experience that it runs smooth it's weird it's that's how i kind of think about projects a lot i know it's a bummer answer but you know that's yeah. how it is <laughs> yeah, no. all right then it's it's very hard to say like oh it's this percentage of that like it mm. it it's everything you know all of it mm. has to kind of work together to create that that package yeah. you know it's you want a smooth experience throughout not just like oh mm. the audio is great but eh, the controls are kind of janky i don't you know when it yeah. all works together so it's almost like you it's one of those things like you don't want people to notice it you want you want it to yeah. be just intuitive. Yeah, yeah, you have, it has to feel, if it feels natural, it is kind of a cliche thing, which I 50% believe, 50% don't, but like, <laughs> if it's natural, you don't notice it. But at the same time, it being a fictional piece of work, you will always notice it. But um, I don't know, it's weird. But um, that kind of reminds me, like, there's a game that I really, actually two games I really want to play, and play them through and that's red dead redemption and witcher 3 mm, but yeah. i hate the controls in both of these games <laughs> yeah. like absolute garbage controls for me personally i just can't play them it's outdated it feels janky it's not good and it's kind of it's kind of funny it's like visually audibly and even like the story setting everything's top notch in these games but the controls kick me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I actually agree with you. I <clears throat> I couldn't get through Red Dead Redemption because they're like, oh, these controls, I can't. I don't know. Yeah, something just goes off, level, right? Yeah, you're in the horse on the fucking hills, and the horse keeps dropping down. You're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but hey, have you played Overwatch? Any of you? I have not. No. No, uh, I'm not so... an Overwatch. <laughs> I. I I'm so bad at like competitive gameplay. I just oh, yeah. can't really. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, yeah. you know, you gotta have the time to get good at it. I, I don't have the time, free time to get so good enough at those games to even really play with people. <laughs> yeah, I have to like tip my hat to those people. It's like the sound design and how they've executed it in that game is just phenomenally good. It's you can hear exactly which enemy character is where based by even their footsteps oh that's cool it's full that's of stuff like that and that's 100 yeah. audio yeah I plus do, of uh, course technical technical uh you know processing but yeah i get addicted to uh rust i don't know if you've ever played that game <laughs> oh i but... 
know the game, but I've never played it. It is the only game I always put my headphones on because I can hear. I almost don't even watch watch the screen. I just listen for people <laughs> around me. When I hear them, I know. Oh, I need to run away, or I need to like chase after that person. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. it's one of those things where like, oh, the sound design in this game makes the game because w if if it didn't work this well, uh, mm. it, it would not be really anywhere near as playable. <laughs> mm. Yeah, exactly. And then there are examples of games. I'm just trying to think, but maybe I won't name any games. But like, there are games that have sound design that's so bad <laughs> that you can't simply. I just cannot play the game because it sounds horrible. And I know it's weird because sounds can do that too. It's like, have you ever watched a YouTube video and or whatever video, and then sound is like very bad. Like yeah, you're like, oh, yeah. I, I can't watch this. This is horrible. And that yeah. sound did that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, growing up, it's an interesting mom, topic. My mom used to play this game, uh, Wario's Woods, on the Super Nintendo. <laughs> oh, and Wario's Woods! It had half. It half the game was uh, like the good mode, and then half was like the the frantic bad mode. And so the music would change between, you know, the peaceful music and then this like god awful. It was just like wah, 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 wah. and it was just <laughs> every time. And and my mom loved this game so much that like I just heard that music so many times to this day. I'm just like I I better never hear that music again. It is it is the devil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. Um. So with your interest in uh in sound design um have you ever done much work or thought about doing work in uh in horror games because it seems like horror games get more attention their, their sound design gets more attention than like you know mm. a, a shooter game yeah that is true and um, yeah i've worked on a few unreleased horror games actually well when i say unreleased i mean abandoned games oh. <laughs> like one of my first video games, it was, it was not commercial work, it was just, you know, working with someone, it was a horror game. But it's just, I don't know what happened, they just stopped replying <laughs> and, I don't know, never heard of them before. Oh, I mean, after. And then um, I worked on this game called, uh, like, Pamela, P-A-M-E-L-A, -E which is like a FPS game, that's kind of semi-horror, with some mm. business stuff. I worked on that as a... Uh, voice actor and I did some sound effects for them as well but I have no idea what's happening with that project and <laughs> if my sounds are even in it anymore <laughs> right uh, but yeah I don't know I, I would like to work on horror games but horror games is one of those things I don't I just can't play them myself it's too scary like <laughs> I really want to play Alien Isolation like I oh. really want to play the game but it's just I, even when I look videos I'm like I can't watch a video sure if I played this, that would a completely different story. Like, I can't do that. Oh, like Silent Hill. I played Silent Hill um, as a kid, the first one. And as soon as in the first scene, you have these, like, small kids with knives. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, 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 no. <laughs> <Enough."> <laughs> yeah, right. That's funny. Yeah. And I still have it this day. I play, like, Borderlands. And I'm, like, all the time, I'm, like, super, like... Um, when I go for like a hallway, I'm like, oh no, oh no, west wind, west wind, west wind, west wind, <laughs> and then it's like, Rang! someone sounds yeah. really, and then it's like, Ugh. I just, I don't know, there's something about it, like, I hate quick confrontations, I guess, like, you know, someone okay. jumping from a corner, like, ah, by this, oh no, right, right, uh, <laughs> that would be a good horror game, someone trying to sell you stuff, every corner, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I would love to work on a horror game, though, but like, the thing with horror games is I feel like a lot of times, like horror movies, they use so many cliches that it's kind of become less scary by audio. Yeah. Like, you know, you watch a horror movie and you hear, like, violence, and like, Dee -dee 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 -dee. you're like, oh, okay, something's going to happen. <laughs> oh, nothing right. happened. And then, like, you turn and, bro, there's something. Oh, no. I didn't see this coming. Um, <laughs> or, like, the volume dims down, and you're like, oh, I wonder if something's going to happen. And, something comes from the ground. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you watch many horror films? Oh, I don't know. 
<laughs> Same thing. So I don't know. They didn't like. I'm not scared of horror films though, because that's not me in there. Like, I've watched a bunch, but to me, they are. They've never really done it to me. I went like, and saw that new that new Heritage movie, and uh, mm. I. I don't think I can go watch horror movies alone anymore because <laughs> mm. oh, wow. maybe it was just me, but I thought it was pretty scary. <laughs> oh, okay. But at the same time, it was it was interesting because there were certain parts of the movie that were just like, I mean, it was clear that they had chosen a style, um, mm. but but the style uh, something about it just made it funny, and so there's certain parts where the whole theater just started laughing. And you're just like, wait a minute, this is a horror movie. We're just, something's not right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, then again, horror movies though, there are some horror movies that just are like horror scenes or ideas, which is why I don't want to watch them anymore. Some of them are just, you know, so ingrained somewhere deep inside. Like in X Files, did you ever watch X Files? Yeah, oh, I've oh, yeah. watched. X-Files yeah, this is times. episode where they where they have these like small like beetle looking bugs and they crawl inside your skin and you can see it inside your skin. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's I saw that when I was like I don't know seven or eight. And Scarred for life. Yeah. Fucking <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's, I, I still like when I'm outside. I live in the countryside. They said, and I go outside. And I'm like, I fucking hope a bug doesn't go inside. Like, <laughs> just, 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 like ooh, it's horrible. Ugh, I just can't stand it. And another thing is gremlins. They gremlins yeah. fuck me up. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm sorry, but like gremlins no, messed fine. me up. Uh, like this is one scene. Like a gremlin is kind of a borderline. It's like comedy yeah. movie, pretty much. Right. But this is one scene where they open like a kitchen cupboard or like cupboard, and there's a gremlin like, and it jumps out, jumps out of the cupboard. Even this day when I open cupboards, I expect <laughs> something to jump out. <laughs> I hate it. Oh. Yeah, that's oh. that's great. Mm. And then there's like movies like uh, I think it was, gosh, what was it called? It was uh, like semi-post-apocalyptic. It's um, mm. have eyes maybe. The hills, the hills have, have eyes. eyes. The hills have eyes. That's, that's the one with right? the yeah, with like the kind of like the hillbillies living in the yeah 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 yeah, 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 that yeah. yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. I watched was, that. Ooh. Yeah, it's it, it's just so. Uh, it's yeah that that movie had like scenes that just you know stuck with me like yeah. like just the ideas behind the scenes are like so grotesque i'm like oh no that's that's oh i don't want to why, why is this in my mind right, right. and they, they're the ones that kind of burrow in so i guess yeah i, I don't I, i'm very about horror movies because of stuff like that but i went to see oh, what's the one where they filmed the uh, blair Witch project too oh yeah Oh, the, three. Oh, two. I don't know which okay. one. The new one, like <laughs> last year or two years ago, or something like that. Uh, there's like a new one, and I watched that, and that didn't leave any impact to me whatsoever. So I watched it, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so now I think we're really out of questions. Uh, you good, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm good. All right, cool. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> so hey thanks for so thanks so much for being on the show man it was a lot of fun mm, oh, thank you uh hope you guys had fun too oh yeah for sure thank you yeah, cool. yeah. um you're welcome back on the show anytime you know especially you want to talk about your new game whatever you know talk about anything yeah, yeah. um sure i think that's it i think we can close out everyone listening thank you so much for listening i hope you like the show if you do please subscribe if you have the means, please consider donating to any of the organizations listed in the description. They do good work. And that's it. Good night, everyone.